on and get your praise on. You know we got it going on at Third Church. At Third Church. Oh, well, the word is broken down for you. It's so easy, it'll make you want to move at Third Church. At Third Church. At Third Church. Good morning, Third Church. My name is David. Thanks for joining us in worship this morning. Here's what's happening at Third Presbyterian Church. If you're new to Third, we welcome you. Connect with us at thirdchurchscl.org connect and fill out our online connect card and past reporters will follow up with you and answer any questions you may have about the church. 
you have the opportunity to fellowship with others while diving deeper into the sermon during our Tuesday and Thursday evening Bible studies. Join us and visit thirdchurchstl.org slash Bible studies for the study materials and the Zoom links. Women of Third, join us for the 15th annual Sister Strut Walk for Breast Cancer Awareness taking place on Saturday, October 5th. Scan the QR code to register and receive a t-shirt, water bottle, and sling bag. Invite your family and friends to join our team. Men are also encouraged to participate. For more information, contact Gwendolyn Bogan or any member of the Women's Ministry Leadership Team. Join us for Adult Sunday School, an excellent chance for both learning and building connections. Classes take place every Sunday morning from 8.30 until 9.45 a.m., either in person upstairs in the gymnasium or via Zoom. If you have any questions or need more details, don't hesitate to contact Beatrice Ruffin. To access the Zoom link, visit thirdchurchstl.org slash sundayschool. A new session of our Truth Be Told Black History class, led by Elder Lee Robinson, is taking place on Wednesday, August 21st at 7 p.m. via Zoom. We'll be discussing the Harlem Renaissance. You can find the Zoom link and the previous session by visiting thirdchurchstl.org slash black history. Our ministry is continuing to help make a difference within our community, but we need your help to reach more lives. We have several ways for you to give, either online, by check, or through our giving app. Visit thirdchurchstl.org slash give to learn more and to contribute. Back to school season is here. While Third Church aims to replenish supplies in January, right now is a great time to take advantage of all the different sales. Our local students need traditional school supplies and uniform shirts. Reach out to Cheryl Jolly Luster or Natasha Barsh for more information and how you can help support our local students. Thanks again for joining us this morning. We hope that you'll stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on YouTube. If you have any questions about anything you've heard this morning, or you would like to find out more about Third Church, visit us online at thirdchurchstl.org. Church family, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious, merciful, and loving Father, we come today saying thank you, Lord. Thank you yet again for smiling on us, for blessing us, for keeping us when we're apart from one another. Father God, we ask this morning that you will forgive us of all of our unrighteousness, that you will cleanse our bodies from the top of our heads to the sole of our feet. And Father God, we pray that today our worship is pleasing to you, O God. Father God, we pray that your people receive your word on this day, Father God. And Father, we ask that you will just watch over our world. Everything that is going on that is not of you, Father God, I pray that you just embolden us as a people, as your people, to be courageous to share the gospel of Christ so that more and more people can be saved during these perilous times. Father, we ask that you continue to bless our ministry. We pray that it grows virtually and we pray that it grows in person. And Father, we also ask that you will continue to watch over our pastor, our ministries, our daycare, our infant care center, and all the workers in the facilities, oh God. We love you, we thank you, and we magnify your holy name. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Falling in love with Jesus.
might feel protected if there is no place I'd rest. I'd rather be oh, falling in love with Jesus. And good morning, Third Church family. Welcome back. Today's lesson in 1 Kings lands us in the 19th chapter, starting at the first verse. Let's go there now. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all of the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life when he came to Beersheba in Judah. He left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he says. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. At once an angel touched him and says, get up and eat. He looked around there and by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and says, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into the cave and spent the night. The word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God Almighty. 
The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord says, go and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountain apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord says to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Seraphat, from Abel, Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Hazal, and Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouth have not kissed him. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearer, reader, and doer of his holy word. And I wanna use a subject for today dealing with depression dealing with depression. So church, last week we saw the great showdown at Mount Carmel where the Lord used Elijah in a great display of power to put the false prophets to death. After this occurred, King Ahab ran back to his evil wife who had been hunting down and killing prophets. And she sent a messenger to go tell Elijah, if by tomorrow you're not dead, may my gods kill me. And this really shook Elijah, and he absolutely panicked and took off running for his life. He ran to Judah, left his servant there. He kept running for a whole day into the desert. He came to a broom tree. He sat down mentally exhausted, physically exhausted, spiritually exhausted, and he just prayed to God, I'm done. I can't take it anymore. I've had enough. Just take my life now. I'm no better than my forefathers. I'm just at my end. I'm done. And in the midst of that prayer, so exhausted, he fell asleep for two days. During that time, God sent an angel to take care of him, to give him food and water and direction. And he traveled for 40 days and nights to Mount Horeb, the same mountain Moses saw God on. And Elijah went into the cave and he spent the night there. And during the time, the word came from the Lord to Elijah and said, what are you doing here? And Elijah replied, you know, God, I've been faithful for you, but for these people have rejected the covenant. They tore up your altars of sacrifice. They killed your prophets. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me too. The Lord says to him, go stand atop the mountain for my presence is about to pass by. And after the wind, the earthquake and the fire, this gentle whisper and Elijah went out to the entrance of the cave and a voice says to him, I'm going to ask you again, why are you here, Elijah? I've been on fire for you doing all of this stuff. Your people rejected your covenant. They broke down your altars. They killed your prophets. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me too. So the Lord says, go back the way you came and you need to anoint two kings and go find Elisha and anoint him to succeed you as prophet. And by the way, you're not the only one left. There are 7,000 in Israel whose heart is still with me. You are not alone, so get going. I read and reread the 19th chapter and I looked for what we needed to extract from this account. I then looked from last week to this week and what happened with Elijah and the Lord gave me this topic of dealing with depression. And let me first say that depression is a real thing. Did you hear that? Depression is a real thing. 
is not made up, is not just exclusive to non-believers, as we will see. Almost everyone at some point deals with some form of depression from minor to acute clinical depression. But unfortunately, most never admit it. They never seek help. Many try to self-medicate and usually ends up in disaster for the person and the people around them. But prayerfully, if you have been paying attention to the sermons, we know better than to fight alone because we are not alone. So there are many antidepressant medications on the market and they are writing tens of millions of prescriptions per year, doing about eight to ten billion dollars in revenue. I see advertisements that go like this. Depression is a journey. I'd made some progress on my antidepressant, had some daily wins in reducing my symptoms, but I was still masking my depression. So I talked to my doctor. She told me I could build on my wins without changing my antidepressant. Rexalti, when added to an antidepressant, significantly reduced depression symptoms more than an antidepressant alone. And less depression, that's a win. Rexalti can cause serious side effects. Elderly dementia patients have an increased risk of death or stroke. Antidepressants may increase suicidal thoughts and actions and worsen depression in children and young adults. Report new or sudden changes in mood, behavior, thoughts, or feelings, or if you develop suicidal thoughts or actions. Report fever, stiff muscles, and confusion, which can be life-threatening, or uncontrolled muscle movements, which may be permanent. High blood sugar, which can lead to coma or death. Weight gain, increased cholesterol, low white blood cells. Unusual urges, dizziness on standing, falls, seizures, trouble swallowing, or sleepiness may occur. Keep moving forward. Ask your doctor about Rexulti. You know when you're not feeling like yourself. Oh. You're tired all the time. Oh. You may feel sad, hopeless, and lose interest in things you once loved. You may feel anxious, can't even sleep. Your daily activities and relationships suffer. You know when you just don't feel right. Now here's something you may not know. These are some symptoms of depression, a serious medical condition affecting over 20 million Americans. While the cause is unknown, depression may be related to an imbalance of naturally occurring chemicals between nerve cells in the brain. Zoloft, a prescription medicine, works to correct this imbalance. When you know more about what's wrong, you can help make it right. Only your doctor can diagnose depression. Zoloft is not for everyone. People taking medicines called MAOI shouldn't take Zoloft. Side effects may include dry mouth, insomnia, sexual side effects, diarrhea, nausea, and sleepiness. Zoloft is not habit forming. Talk to your doctor about Zoloft, the number one prescribed brand of its kind. Zoloft, when you know more about what's wrong, you can help make it right. And when I would see these commercials, I would think that everyone who is depressed has a chemical imbalance. One of the triumphs of psychiatrists is to find that magic pill, that powerful potion that will correct the imbalance and give people everywhere relief from the dark moments of sadness and hopelessness. But not all depression is a chemical imbalance. Depression is a very real part of life for many people. As a young minister, I was at a church where we had a revival service. And as a part of the revival service, we had altar prayer. And several people would come down for prayer. And so you had about 100 people in line and about 10 ministers praying for all of them. Afterwards, I asked some of the other ministers, when people made their prayer requests, what specifically did they ask you to pray for? The response that two out of three people asked for prayer was for their depression. And I said, I thought it would be more like a physical need, a financial need, but so many says, I'm depressed. I feel unworthy. I see no future. I have no hope. And I was just outdone that so many church folk feel unworthy and helpless. Let me repeat this. Depression can be a very real problem. So if you would just hang in there with me for a little while this morning, I want you to see how God dealt with this issue of depression with his prophet, Elijah, in hopes that we can glean some tools and have a plan when we find ourselves in a dark place of depression. So from the scripture, we see that Elijah experienced many of the classic symptoms of clinical depression. He was fearful. 
says Elijah was afraid he ran for his life. He had suicidal tendencies. Elijah prayed that he might die. He says, I've done enough, Lord. He says, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. He had excessive tiredness. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. He slept for a couple of days, maybe longer. He has feelings of rejections. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put all your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And he experienced the depression for a long time, nearly two months. And look, all of this occurred immediately following Elijah's preaching, one of the greatest sermons of his life. He confronted the false prophets at Mount Carmel, and because of his faith and obedience to God, God literally sent fire down to consume the sacrifice, and it began to rain on the land, and it had not seen rain in three years. We think to ourselves, why would a man who preached an impressive message and had experienced some of the most powerful displays of God's power, why would he suddenly be crippled by fear and hopelessness and despair? Why would he run away to such a desolate corner of the world and seek to die? There's probably all kinds of reasons, but the fact of the matter is he did. What this tells us is that even in God's most dynamic servants, they too can suffer from depression. And listen carefully, it's not necessarily a mark of a lack of faith. It's not necessarily a mark of an immoral life. Elijah was the man of God in his day. And now he's so far down in the depths of despair that even up looks wrong to him. Hear me, church. Depression is not a lack of faith. It is not a sin. It is not that I'm not trusting God. It is not a sign that you're not saved. Church folk need to stop beating people up and beating themselves up with this broken theology that if you truly saved, you wouldn't be depressed. If Elijah battled with depression, then I do believe anyone is susceptible to dealing with it. So here we have Elijah praying to die. But that's not where God left him. And the good news today, because this is not where God is going to leave you. Listen, if you find yourself in a state of depression, it's not a test from God to see if you have enough faith to pull yourself up out of it. If you find yourself in a state of depression, please remember that God is for you, not against you. God will not put more on us than we can bear, but the world will constantly try to do that. The world is trying to break you, and God is constantly healing and strengthening and fortifying you. Let's be real. Don't matter how saved you are, the world, circumstances, sometimes they get punches in and they knock us down. And yes, we know God is able. We know the miracles of God. We've read the miracles of God. We see the miracles of God. We know God is everything. Yet the loudest sound we're hearing in this moment is repossession. I hear foreclosure. I hear eviction, hunger, sickness in my body. I hear a broken relationship. Kids not living up to their potential. I hear relatives have died and job loss and retired and I don't have any purpose anymore. God, I know you're able. But right now, I'm not able. And I just want this to stop. I'm overwhelmed. I want to feel better. I want to just die. Take me now, Lord. And this is where Elijah found himself this morning. And guess what? God didn't say, well, sorry, Elijah, you have a chemical imbalance and Zoloft and Lexapro won't be available for a few thousand years, so I can't help you. Oh, no. Long before psychiatry was ever thought of, 
long before relief could be brought through little pills, long before we had clinics and psychiatrists and psychologists, not meaning any disrespect to those professions or the clinics they run, but long before all of that, God healed a man of depression and it was not an isolated instance. And what God did for Elijah, God can do for you and me as well. So let's look at what God did in these few verses. God recognized Elijah's depression, that it wasn't an imaginary problem. Elijah's depression was real. It was tangible. You could cut it with a knife. And God didn't say, get a hold of yourself, Elijah. This is a sinful attitude. Where is your faith? This is where I used to be as a young minister until depression visited me. When someone was speaking to me about depression and trying to understand it, my first reaction was, where is your faith? Don't you know that God is able? Look at all of the blessings that you have. And that was a big problem. When someone is dealing with depression, the last thing you need to do is tell them to look at all of the reasons they have not to be depressed. Look at where you live. Look at your health, your family, your education. Look, you got all of this stuff. Listen, God made man to have dominion over all things. This means that things will never ultimately fulfill and stuff cannot heal us from depression. Depression is a spiritual battle and physical stuff will only divert, pacify, or temporarily medicate, but the reality of having stuff will not deliver from depression. Yes, people in third world countries are, are starving. I have more than enough food, but that does not help me with the way I'm feeling right now. But look at what God did in response to Elijah's prayer to die. God just let him sleep. Then God's angel fed him and let him sleep some more. Then God sends him down to the desert in the south for 40 days and 40 nights. In all that time, God doesn't say a word. God doesn't offer any counsel. God doesn't set Elijah down to have a face-to-face -face talk. In all that time, Elijah is left alone and given time to rest and think. There was a woman whose son died in a fire. She was home alone and she received the call that her son had died. Just, just a word of caution. A person should never be alone hearing this type of news over the phone. Alone, she heard the news. Something inside of her just snapped. And when her husband got home, he found her disoriented, in a state of shock. And the next day, her other son was trying to have a conversation with her, and she would say, Dave is dead. Yes, Mom, Dave, Dave is dead. And, and she'd talk about David for a while, and then her eyes would glass over, and she'd ask again, Is David dead? Yes, Mom, Dave is dead. And the conversation would repeat itself over and over and over again. It's never easy to see someone you love go through such brokenness. The doctors advised her husband to put her in the hospital for a while, but the husband says, no, I'll never get her back if I do that. And for the next few days, her husband never left her side. He waited on her hand and foot. He held her. He spoke kindly to her. No, no probing questions, no miracle pills, no nurses in white, just rest and love. And in time, she recovered and dealt with her grief. In essence, this is what God did with Elijah. No sermons, no long counseling sessions, just love and rest. Church, as I've said before, there is a such thing called the ministry of presence, where we just need to be presence for and with someone who is going through a bout of depression. We are not in their life at that moment to fix anything. Just allow them the fellowship, allow them the rest, and give them love. But after the love and rest, God dealt with Elijah's depression. And he had four things he did in these short verses that got his prophet back on track. The first thing he did is God sent 
him to church. Then God had Elijah tell him what the problem was. God then dealt with his false belief and false ideas that were fueling his depression. And lastly, God gave Elijah something to do. Now, now let's take each one of them at a time. The first remedy to cure his depression, God sent him to church. God sent him to Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. This is where the law was given to Moses. In Hebrews 10 and 25, God tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, which implies if we do forsake the assembly of the saints, we will have a need that lies void in our life. What I found is that the church is one of the best places to start to deal with the issue of depression. When church is done right, it's a place where we listen to each other. We help one another. We bear the burdens of one another so to fulfill the law of Christ. It is a place where the saints come together and lift up the name of Jesus, a place where we are reminded of the promises of God, a place where we hear testimony of God's deliverance of others. You see, depression is a spiritual battle. And the church is a place where we are spiritually fed to be strong to overcome this battle. This is why I encourage people to come, not just for themselves, but for others. Church, when we're living life together, we know when someone is going through. And to see this person coming and loving the Lord is just uplifting to us. The church is a spiritual hospital not a place to just come and get dressed up and put on a front. So the second thing that God did to heal Elijah's depression is to have Elijah tell him what the problem was. So God asked, what are you doing here, Elijah? God didn't ask this question just once. He asked the same question two separate times. What are you doing here? Well, didn't God know? Of course he knew. He's the one that sent Elijah to this mountain. But Elijah needed to vocalize what was wrong in his life. Elijah needed to explain what he thought the problem was. Many times when in a depressed state, people talk around the problem or they just hold it all in. And the problem with holding it in is that explosions will eventually occur. If we talk to most people who are in a depressed state, the last thing they want to do is talk. It's too painful to talk about. No, it's too painful to keep it in. One day as a child, I smashed my thumb with a hammer and I could see under the nail it was bleeding. The pressure was so great that I was just screaming in pain. And after about an hour trying to figure out what to do, I took a knife and began to drill down in my thumbnail. And as painful as that was, when I broke through and there was a release of blood, it brought so much relief. And no, I didn't want to drill a hole in my thumbnail, but it was the only way that relief came. And I say that to you, you may not feel like talking about it, but talk we must before there is an eruption that causes more pain for ourselves and for others. And once Elijah verbalized his belief about what was wrong, God then dealt with his false belief, the false ideas that were fueling his depression. Jesus says the truth shall make you free. Why is that? Because false ideas and false belief, especially false ideas about God, they have the power to put us in bondage. Our lives are built around what we think is true about life. And if the foundations of that reasoning are based on wrong information or impressions, the result can be very devastating. Elijah's reply to God revealed what Elijah had wrong. Elijah didn't think that God was doing anything. In verse 19, Elijah replied to God and says, I have been very zealous for you, Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars. They put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. You see, hidden in the midst of this statement was this accusation that I've been beating my head against the wall, serving you, Lord, and everything seems to just be falling apart around me. God, what have you been doing? It's your fault, God, that I'm in this predicament. And so God corrects Elijah's thinking. He tells him, Elijah, 
you're not the only one left. I created this world. And as sinful as it is, there will always be a remnant who will serve me. All of creation bows down to me. But there are 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed down to idol. As with us, we are never alone. God didn't create us to live alone. And we will always be surrounded by others who love him, serve him, and love us. At times in life, it seems like evil is winning and we just get so frustrated. God will always have a remnant. God will never allow the good seed to be destroyed by the bad seed. When a person is depressed, they don't think that God is doing much of anything. They have no hope, no confidence. God isn't easily seen by this person. A person in depression needs to realize that just like Elijah, God is working in my life. Even when I can't see him, God is always for me, never against me. Even in my darkest moment, God will show the light of his working it out for our good and to his glory. So God got Elijah in the church. He got him to tell him what was wrong and he corrected some of his false beliefs. And lastly, God gave Elijah something to do. When God finished his counseling session with Elijah, Elijah was still in the complaining mood, but God basically tells him, get back to work. I've got a job for you to do. Make yourself useful. You have a purpose that will not end in this state, in this cave. Go back the way you came and anoint two kings and Elisha to be your successor. What God was telling Elijah is the same thing that he's telling us. I have work for you to do and it will not end in a dark room of your house or your basement. Lock up your house, go into community, find someone in need and help that person. To overcome discouragement, don't focus on yourself. Get involved in the lives of other people. Let me say this. It can be a Real feel-good experience in worship today, suffering through depression, through the preach word, the same word, and feel a little better about things. But my encouragement to you to defeat this battle of depression is we must remain focused after the benediction. After we log off today, tomorrow at work, the rest of the week, remain focused after the benediction. What cave are you in this morning? The cave of offense? Are you mad at God or someone else? Have you withdrawn because you're secretly angry? The cave of despondency? Are you feeling numb and isolated from people and places? What is your cave this morning? While Elijah was in his cave, he heard the soft voice of God. He got out of his cave of self-pity. The events on the mountain were the catalyst that brought him back into connection with God. You see, like us, Elijah needed to come out of his cave in order to rediscover God. He needed to learn that as God was with him when things were good, God is still with him when things are tough. God doesn't always keep us from going through tough and difficult times, but he does promise to walk through them with us. Hearing God's whisper reminded Elijah that God was still in control of all circumstances. It's time to emerge from our caves this morning. God has encouraged us to move out of our caves this morning and be reminded that God will always give us what we need when we need it. Church, please look to God working in and through situations where we're feeling inadequate, when we're feeling alone, when we're feeling that no one cares or no one is listening. God cares. God is listening. God called you to this and God will be with you through this. You have to believe that God is not going to leave you in the valley of the shadow of death. But we are heading up the mountain of victory with a testimony, with a hallelujah, that in my darkest moment, God was there. In my emotional breakdown, God wiped the tears from my eyes. In my fit of rage, God gave me peace. When I was broken, God put me back together. When I felt alone, God gave me a church family and showed me that I am not the only one serving him. 
I am not the only one faithful to God. I am not the only one battling with depressions. I have siblings that will stand with me, fight for me, pray with me and pray for me. So draw strength today from the fact that when we are feeling down, that God has not deserted us. God is with us in the wilderness. God is with us in our cave of doubt. God has work for us to do, and our job is to remain focused after the benediction. Church, depression is real, but depression is not a death sentence. God wants to heal you everywhere you hurt if you will let him. I want to thank you for tuning in today. Next week, we're going to continue this study of 1 Kings with a sermon titled, Passionate About Christ. I pray that you join us as we continue to grow spiritually with our study in the word of God. Until then, remember, be patient, be kind, be compassionate to everyone you come in contact with. And at your darkest moments, you are not alone. God bless you and God keep you. And we'll see you next week. Should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? For when Jesus is my portion, a
and I know he watches over me. Happy and I sing because I'm free. I said, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know. That you know, that I know, that we know that he watches over me.